Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Ertman. I am the president of the Rotary Club of Portland. Welcome to our online video weekly membership meeting. So as you might know, many months ago, I had first learned that our club's weekly spokes newsletter is actually bound every year in book form. I actually have one here like this, our book form of all of our spokes that are our newsletter every week. And um, we have these for about 80 years. We have so many. So I've taken to going back and looking at some of them on occasion. And I found something this past weekend from the October 8th, 1968 issue. And I would like to read it to you now. It's quite short. Here it goes. In consequence of long established principles of operation, Rotary Clubs are encouraged to seek out and discover needs, local community needs, national needs, international needs. But a Rotary Club is not expected to remedy needs. The function of a Rotary Club is to awaken persons to the necessity of the remedy, to awaken ourselves as Rotarians every bit as much as to awake non-Rotarians and to arouse individuals as to their responsibilities. We cannot do much for the world until, first of all, we do something for ourselves. Rotary emphasizes personal service. The effectiveness of Rotary is achieved only in the measure that each member of each Rotary Club takes personal, vigorous, and constructive action to promote the principles necessary for the existence of Rotary and for the preservation of a free society, justice, truth, sanctity of the pledge word, and respect. For human rights. I thought it was kind of appropriate to read that right now. And that's from, um, again, from the October 8th, 1968 issue of Spokes. And it was a quote from the um, Rotary International General Secretary, George R. Means. So now I would like to pass it on to Rotarian Reem Ghanaim to give this week's reflection. And Reem, can't hear you. There we okay. go. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, in light of the recent events, um, I would like to quote uh, Martin Luther King. He said, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. So in light of what happened recently, we are reminded that peace building is not a luxury, it's a duty. And that duty um, requires a lot of um, on our end to do. So in honor of George Floyd's life, we all need to deeply learn about the systematic racism against black people and minorities in the US. We cannot afford to neglect our duty to educate, elevate and advocate for civil rights and peace. We need to get more active in influencing our local politics to advance civil rights and peace for all. It is never over. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Reem. That was very apropos and um, great encouragement for all of us Rotarians. Thank you. I would like to welcome any virtual guests. Thank you for tuning into our weekly membership meeting. And hey, it's June. And I'd like to extend a happy anniversary to everyone who became a Rotarian in the month of June. You can see the list of the anniversaries uh, right here, as well as in the email that you got that has the video to this meeting. And you can also look on our website under the header of membership. As always, my fellow Rotarians, looking at the anniversary list, it is a great way to help you decide which fellow Rotarian you may check in with this week, especially because you will now have that opportunity to say happy anniversary. And you can also thank them for their years of service above self. Also each month, we highlight one of our committees. And for the month of June, it is our Youth Exchange Committee. Last week, we heard from David Knoll, the chair of the committee. And I am excited to say that this week, we have Rotary Youth Exchange student, Jess Nava, to tell you about her time in Portland. Jess. Thanks. Um, Oh, 
you like to share with us today, Jess? Hi, my name is Jessica. I'm from Mexico. I am a change student. Well, my change student is... Do the question. The Uh, so, what is this? And, um, so, what is this? And, what is this? And, what is this? And, what is this? And, what is it's a experience incredible and my host family is so nice um, I had uh, three fa host families and my trip my best trip is when I go with my old friends that changes to them in California uh, we're going to the Disney and San Francisco and I, it's fun, and I never, uh, fui? You haven't gone to? I haven't gone mm -hmm. uh, in California, and this year is, there is a many surprise because coronavirus, coronavirus and the protest but i i am good and i have uh, so many friends in oregon in portland and in united states is very different uh, mexico um, and like a uh, school and um, the families and the school is very different because here is the start the school is starting the eight in Mexico is a six story and here uh, the end the school is a thirty twenty and Mexico is a twelve and it's very different in in two and food and I it's very difficult when I arrive here. Uh, eat the food, no Mexico. <laughs> and yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Jess, for, for sharing all that with us. We've been wondering how you've been knowing that you have stayed here instead of um, being able to get back home. So it sounds like you have found some some good friends and um, yeah, you got to experience a, an exchange, you've had an exchange experience basically, unlike probably any of the other exchange students we've ever had. <laughs> so I'm glad that you are here and you're safe and um, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you. you. Great. Okay, now I would like to move on to our chair of the day. Please welcome Rotarian Mike Pendergast as today's Chair of the Day. Thank you, Kate, President Kate. You're doing such a wonderful job this year, especially amidst all the uncertainty. And thank you for maintaining the leadership and keeping things going in a very positive and proactive way. Well, everyone, today I get the pleasure to introduce a very special woman, and she's coming in remotely from way out east. And her name is Paula Antonini. And you may know that last name because one of our very own, Eric Antonini, who has also uh, been a member of our club. So she has been married for 54 years to the same gentleman. And she has three grown successful married children and seven amazing grandchildren. And that alone is an achievement in and of, of itself. But be, in addition to that, she has been a power force in the direct sales industry for over 40 years. She worked for the Tupperware company for 27 years. Now raise your hand if you know anybody, uh, a parent or a friend who has hosted or been part of one of those Tupperware parties. I remember that when I was a kid. 
She was vice president of the Northwest region and director of sales force development in Russia in the 90s. So imagine going into a Cold War, war country and trying to develop um, a democratic and cutting edge marketing type of industry. She'll talk about that. She also worked for Cutco. She was a director of international sales for two years. And then she worked for a company called The Body Shop at Home. As general manager, she created the selling model, training and compensation plan and all promotional aspects of this business. She built it to $40 million in four years and then transitioned to director of global development in the UK, totaling nine years with that company. Now she is in alignment with ethics like our Rotary Club. And so she was, she served on the executive board of the Direct Selling Association Board of Directors in DC. That is the industry's premier association to govern the ethics and standards of its members and companies. Now she's about 75 and you'd think she's uh, ready to sail into enjoying the rest of her life at leisurely, but that's not the case. At the age of 64, she went back to school to study nutrition at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition in New York City and became a health coach. So she started a whole new career at the age of 64. She's been practicing for 12 years now and in 2014 joined doTERRA. Many of you might have heard that name. And she's currently at the age of 75 building and supporting a platinum team as, we, as she educates people about essential oils. Now, in terms of the direct selling industry, some of you might have had a negative experience. Many of you have had a positive and life-changing experience from it, and some of you know nothing about it at all. So who better to enlighten us about the inner workings of this industry than Paula Antonini? Paula? Thank you, Mike. Um, I feel like I've had the most blessed career because I have been able to do exactly what I want to do for so many years and have helped lots and lots of people changing lots of lives. So you can see there the logos of the various companies as Mike was describing to you. But I thought I would start off by just sharing with you, why did I do this in the first place? What, what got it all started? I <laughs> grew up during the real Cold War, which was in the 60s. I graduated from high school in 1962. And my mission in life was to save the world from communism. And so as a result of that, I ended up majoring in Russian studies. So I majored in language history, ge uh, geography, political science, and all of that, and really intended that someday I would do some grand thing like become an ambassador or, you know, some wonderful sounding thing. But I got married instead, married a guy who lived in Louisville, Kentucky. And so I taught high school and I had minored in French. So I ended up teaching French in high school. And that was okay. I, you know, I, uh, there were some things about the position that, um, aggravated me. I, I tend to be very passionate about the things I believe in. And, um, and so I had a, a star football player in one of my French classes. He didn't do the work and he failed. So I gave him a failing grade only to discover later that the the guy in charge of, uh, I guess he was called the Dean of Boys or something, uh, ended up changing the grade because it would have affected negatively the football team. I don't deal with that sort of thing very well. You know, it's like, come on, right is right, the guy failed. So I was dying to get out of teaching and uh, ended up t going on maternity leave to have our first child. And while I was on maternity leave, I went to a Tupperware party. Now, I had never been to a Tupperware party. I didn't know anything about direct selling, but um, the lady who was doing the demonstration said, if you're, anybody here is interested, I can tell you how you could do what I do. And I said, do you actually get paid to do this? She said, yes, I'm a registered nurse. Uh, I, was make, I, I am make, making more money as a Tupperware lady than I was as a full-time nurse in a hospital. I said, okay, so sign me up. So <laughs> that's what started it all. And I discovered when I went to my first Tupperware meeting that all of the leaders in Tupperware had a company car. It was a beautiful Ford station wagon. And so I went home from that meeting and said to my lovely husband, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a really successful Tupperware lady and they're going to give me a car. And he literally patted me on the head and said, come on, honey, nobody's going to give a woman a car. 
Now this was 1970, so <laughs> a different time in our world. But of course, that's all I needed to say to him, well, you just watch, buddy, because I'm going to have that car. And I ended up, I think, with nine different Tupperware cars because every two years you had to turn your car in, get a new one. The company paid for the tires. It was a lovely program. And then I told my mother what I was doing. And she said, oh, dear Lord, I paid money for you to get a degree. You don't even have to read and write to sell Tupperware. Well, of course, that's not true, but she didn't know. And so she was really embarrassed that I was a Tupperware lady. And, and she's been dead a long time now, but, but uh, she never told her friends. She lived in a different city. She never told her friends what I was doing because she was embarrassed. <laughs> so anyway, in those days, the only choices for women really were teach school, be a nurse, be an administrative assistant. That was about the extent of the opportunities that were available. So this thing that I had discovered where I could decide how much money I was gonna make, this was really exhilarating. Uh, the picture you see there, by the way, is Brownie Wise. She's the, the Tupperware lady who started that whole thing. And, uh, and she's been gone for a long time now too, but really interesting woman. Uh, okay, so now why was that appealing to me? Why is it appealing? Uh, to mostly women, but there certainly are plenty of men in the Tupperware world. Well, the first thing is that I could decide how much I want, uh, how much I worked. I had a new baby. I wanted to stay home with him. I didn't want to be gone all day. And so I could decide how many parties a week am I going to hold and be gone only when I wanted to. I could decide exactly how much money I wanted to make. I'll never forget on my way to that first meeting, I rode with the lady who had introduced me to Tupperware. And, uh, and she told me a story about someone who had uh, earned enough money to buy a farm. Well, our dream was to buy a horse farm. I grew up in Kentucky. We were living uh, in Louisville and my husband really loved the idea of someday having a couple of brood mares, do some breeding, uh, have some racing going on in our lives. And I thought, this is it. I'll certainly never do that teaching school, but I can do that selling Tupperware. And uh, I could also take time off when it, was, when it worked for me. I didn't ever have to ask anybody if I wanted to go on vacation. And of course, that's, that's still the beauty of what I do today. I can do what I want to do when I want to do it, and I don't have to ask permission. Um, and the other thing that is really appealing about this industry to people who get into it is that I worked for myself. It was my business, but I never worked by myself. I always had someone there to teach me, support me, and help me. And the recognition that is available to people in the direct selling world is truly extraordinary. So I'm gonna tell you a quick story about that. Um, one year we had our Tupperware National Convention in Las Vegas. And I was recognized as one of the top salespeople. And, and in that recognition, I think it was the top 10 people got to come on stage and play a little game. And they had rigged up a oh, kind of a, a slot machine thing. And so I could put in like a, let's say a cardboard coin and see what happened. Well, I got a thousand dollars, a thousand silver dollars came out of that machine and uh and i remember the guy who was uh, head of the that particular conference said to me at the end of it you know if you would rather we can write you a check for a thousand dollars so that you don't have to carry home the thousand silver dollars and i said to him you know what you could keep the thousand dollars if you let me walk across that stage one more time that's how powerful recognition is and in most jobs you don't get a lot of it not a lot of, of pat on the back, you've done a good job and all of that. The other story is that when I was fairly new in Tupperware, well, I'd probably been in three months, four months, I got a note, a handwritten note in the mail from the lady in that region of the com com uh, country. And she said something like this, Paula, we've been watching you and we can tell you have leadership potential. So I want to invite you to attend our leadership training class. We'd love it so much if you would come. I still have that note because that again is not the kind of thing that goes on a lot. And it meant so much to me that somebody was paying attention. I thought I was doing a pretty good job, but I wasn't sure. And of course, the training that goes on in all direct selling companies is extraordinary. There are many successful business people who got their start in direct sales. 
And in direct sales, they learned to believe in themselves. They learned to believe that they could accomplish whatever they wanted. And they were challenged to get out of their comfort zone and try new things. And I, I have two friends, and both of whom are named Dolores, who started as a Tupperware lady with me, who are now and have been for many years very successful in the real estate business. And they both attribute their success in real estate to their start in direct selling. So it, it really is a, an appealing thing. Now, as a Tupperware lady, and you can see there, I, I had some fun and interesting things going on. I started in Louisville, which is where we were living, and I built a thriving team uh, locally in the Louisville area. In those days, you weren't even allowed to recruit outside of your county. So I couldn't have recruited somebody even in the next county. But of course, in today's direct selling world, you can recruit people all over the world because technology has simplified all of that. But I had a really thriving team right there locally. And then my husband took a job in San Diego. So we moved to California and I had to start all over again. Now I had built a successful team, but I had never lived in California and I couldn't imagine anything more scary. I really thought everybody in California was weird, right? And so I had to figure out how am I going to meet people? How am I going to go out and do it? And, and for the first two weeks that we were there, we lived in a, a hotel and I didn't go anywhere. Finally, one day, Bill said to me, you know what, I don't care if you do Tupperware here or not. I just want you to know I'm not buying you a car. So if you value having that company car, you might want to think about doing something. And so that motivated me to, to get out and go to the local meeting and, and meet a few people. I discovered, of course, they were all pretty normal people. And I started doing um, what was called friend finding in the day. And that meant that I actually went out and knocked on doors in neighborhoods I had never seen before and introduced myself, told the people I was the Tupperware lady. And in many cases, they didn't even know what Tupperware was in those days. So I had to explain it to them, demonstrate it, and I kept doing that consistently and built the number one team in the nation. Now, why did I do that? Why was I able to do that? Because I didn't ever want to go back to that real job that uh, I didn't like in, in the teaching world. So after I built my team to being number one in the whole world, Tupperware world in the US, there were about 10,000 leaders and I was the number one person. Then uh, the company offered us an opportunity to become Tupperware distributors, which meant we would actually own a Tupperware franchise. That's not the business model today, but in those days, um, uh, my husband actually had to join me or they wouldn't have allowed me to be a distributor. <laughs> But uh, so we moved to Chicago and, uh, and he was happy to do it because I was making a lot more money than he was. But just to point out on, on the pictures you see here, that's of course me wearing my little chair up because I had been recognized as number one. And then Bill and me together standing in front of the Tupperware Learjet because that was another form of recognition. They took us on a trip and we got to fly on the Learjet. We went to Scottsdale and stayed in some lovely place and, and had, we were just wined and dined and entertained nicely. Uh, and that was part of the recognition. And then, so to all total then, I guess I'd been in Tupperware 15 years when the company approached me and said, would you like to join us on the corporate team in Orlando? Um, you know, the reason I had joined was to have freedom and flexibility, but it was intriguing to think that I could become part of the corporate team and train people all over the country, do a lot of travel and so on. So we sold our distributorship, moved to Orlando, and I joined the corporate team. So I went from that field freedom to corporate life again. Um, and <laughs> I'm very grateful I did it because I learned lots of things, but, uh, but it, it, I had to give up the freedom. Anyway, ended up becoming the vice president of the Northeast uh, for Tupperware, had lots of wonderful uh, times, met people all over the country and made lots and lots of friends. And then Tupperware started to decline a bit and they started downsizing. So they let me go and that was uh, back in the 90s. And when I left Tupperware, that, that was 25 years I had been with them at that point. And I just thought, what do I know how to do? I don't know how to do anything except Tupperware. Luckily, they sent me through an outplacement, uh, the Drake Theme Company, and I had an opportunity to work with a counselor who helped me to see what kinds of skills I had. 
and to, uh, to let me realize that actually it wasn't Tupperware that I had learned, it was a business that I had learned. And so I ended up uh, getting a job then as the director of international sales for Cutco, the knife company I'm sure you're all familiar with. They wanted to have a different business model outside of the US because in the US their business model is uh, college students and that really doesn't work in other cultures. So I developed a home party business for them in international, the international world and had a chance to work in a number of different countries. And then one day I got a phone call from Tupperware. Now before I left Tupperware, I made sure I took the president of the company to lunch one day. And I said, I just want you to know that I speak Russian and I don't think there's anybody else in the company who does. So just remember that because one of these days Russia will be ready for Tupperware. So I got a phone call from the president of Tupperware after two years away. And he said, I remembered what you said. The board has just decided we're going to launch in Russia, and I wondered if you'd like to be a part of it. So I resigned at Cutco, went back to Tupperware, and my husband and I moved to St. Petersburg, and I was able to launch the business there. It truly was a dream come true, and I'm going to tell you some stories about Russia, but um, <clears throat> my dream had been to save the world from communism. I had a chance now to teach them the purest form of capitalism, so it, it really was a dream. And then when we came home from Russia, uh, after a couple of years there, I became director of international sales again, but this time for Creative Memories, which is a scrapbooking company. They um, had a, a really interesting business model, and um, <clears throat> it was a home party business. And I was able to launch the business in Japan. I did work in Australia, New Zealand, and Germany, and, and just, again, had a wonderful time traveling internationally and teaching people about direct selling. And then one day I had a, a, a phone call from a headhunter. Uh, the Body Shop is a, a retail company, a British retail company. You probably have known the, Brit the Body Shop stores in Portland. Uh, they're kind of all over the country, although not as big here as they are outside of the US, but they wanted to have a direct selling division in the US and so they hired me to create the body shop at home. It was an amazing business, a wonderful company. We built it to, uh, as Mike told you, about 40 million in sales and then they transferred us to England because I, I was then the global director of it and uh, we were gonna develop it globally. So we launched in Germany first and then the unfortunate thing happened, uh, L'Oreal, which is the biggest personal care company in the uh, world, bought the body shop and they bought it because they wanted the retail stores. They didn't know there was a direct selling division. They didn't really want to know, they didn't understand it. And so they just shut it down and let me go. So at that point I said to Bill, you know what? I'm not gonna be an employee any, anymore. I'm gonna go back to the field. I'm gonna find a way to work for myself again so that I can have the freedom and flexibility. And so I went back to school to the Institute for Integrated Nutrition, became a health coach, and have worked for a long time now helping people get their health back. And then about five and a half years ago, discovered essential oils and joined doTERRA. And that's, of course, the, these last two things. I got my freedom back and just so much happier to be in charge of my life. Now, I wanted to share with you some experiences of being in Russia because it, it truly was, uh, well, a dream come true from the perspective of helping Russian people discover what capitalism was all about. Uh, but a, a, an interesting and a unique experience. I spent three months in Germany to prepare for it, and that was an experience all in itself. Quick story, I, um, I worked in Germany in the Tupperware German office, um, for three months, and when I first got there, I was um, I, I was the only female involved in the planning and strategic development of what was going to happen in Russia. I did not know for the first three weeks I was there they were having daily meetings to talk about what was going to happen, and I had not been invited because I was a woman. And so <clears throat> finally. When I realized what was going on, I put up a big fuss, as you might imagine, and uh, the guy who was the head of Tupperware Germany <clears throat> decided, okay, we can invite Paula to the meeting. So I went to the next meeting. The meeting lasted 15 minutes, and they, they took a lunch break and never reconvened because they were not going to have this woman 
in their meetings. So I was able to provide input, but it couldn't be within the context of that meeting. A really interesting experience. <laughs> anyway, so then we got to Russia <clears throat> and, um, and we uh, had just a, an incredible experience at first being shocked because in those days, everyone in this country was terrified of the Russians, that it, it was a, a really fearful thing. When we got there and saw what, it what was reality, it took away all of that fear because frankly, the country was crumbling. The, all the money they had was spent on the military, but there was nothing else happening there that would cause us to have any concern that we need to, to be fearful. And I'll give you some specific stories. I'm going to tell you about our first three weeks in the hotel, which was just unbelievable. And then, of course, we had to set up the Tupperware business there. So the first, uh, before Bill went with me, I went to Moscow and, um, and stayed for a month to uh, get my language back because it had been 35 years since I had majored in Russian and now living in Russia. And so while I thought I, I spoke Russian, it, it didn't all come back instantly. So I, I was able to go to Moscow for a month and work with a tutor, which was great. I lived in, in a hotel and the hotel was directly across the street from the Bolshoi Theater, which you see pictured here. So <clears throat> the first day I was to meet with my tutor she told me to meet her in front of the Bolshoi Theater. Well, that seemed pretty straightforward. All I had to do was cross the street and, and stand in front of the theater and wait for her. But I, I hadn't actually physically been there before. The, the street that I was gonna cross was, I believe, 16 lanes. It was a really wide boulevard and cars going uh, lickety-split both directions and no traffic light, no crosswalk, nothing. And so I stood there on the curb. I must have stood there 15 minutes trying to figure out what the heck am I going to do? How am I going to get over there without getting killed? And thankfully, a nice Russian person who spoke a little bit of English came to, up to me and said, are you trying to get over there? And I said, yes. He took me by the hand and he said, come with me. And that's when I discovered the Pirihod. The Pirihod is the underneath, uh, under the road walkway, <laughs> which is actually a great idea. We don't seem to have them here, but it's like a walking subway sort of thing. And so he took me down the steps into the Pirihod and, uh, and underneath I discovered there was this whole economy going on. So first of all, you see the people pictured here those people are Russian workers who have perhaps worked in a factory making bras or cigarettes or anything. And the only way they get paid was to take their wares. They are paid in merchandise and then they have to go sell it. And so in the Pirihod are all these people selling the wares of wherever it is they're working and that's how they got their money. Uh, anyway, I was able then to cross under the Pirico and get over to the Bolshoi Theater and meet my tutor. And then she took me by the hand and said, we're going to get on the Metro, which is the subway. Uh, that was an interesting experience, jam-packed. In today's world, it's almost a joke because, I mean, we were jammed in like cattle in a, in a, a subway car. But we got off the subway and then walked several blocks and then she stopped us on the side of the road and started raising her hand like she was flagging down a taxi, but there really weren't any taxis. There was really this Uber thing going on in Russia <laughs> before Uber was a thing. And so she would just flag down anybody who was willing to stop and she would give them a few rubles to take us to where we wanted to go. So that was interesting too, getting into a, a strange car, no taxi markings. I didn't have any idea what was gonna to happen to me that day, but uh, we made it safely to her flat and then we did the work in her flat and then she would take me back to the hotel at the end of the day. Uh, the hotel where when we first actually arrived there to start the Tupperware business in St. Petersburg, we checked into the Prebaltiskia Hotel. And that's a picture of it. It really is monstrous like that. Uh, and uh, the Prebaltiskia had this enormous, uh, uh, what do you call it, the registration counter for you to check into your room. So we picked a lady, you know, walked up and, and registered and, uh, and she tried to explain some things to us that didn't make any sense. But one of the things was that if you make a phone call and understand cell phones didn't exist yet. If you make a phone call, then you must pay your phone bill right away. Otherwise you can't stay in the hotel. 
And, and you know, I, I heard what the words, but I didn't really believe that it was quite that strict. So the first night, I guess we called our kids to say we had arrived and we used the hotel phone and, you know, used a long distance service. And then we went to bed. At midnight, someone's pounding on our door and we tried to ignore it, finally went to the door and found out it was someone from the front desk saying, you didn't pay your phone bill. You don't get to stay another night. So every single day we had to go down and pay the phone bill or we wouldn't get to sleep. <laughs> and, and that's the sort of thing that happened in that culture of no trust. They didn't trust that people would pay when they checked out. So they had to collect the money every single day. Anyway, we lived in the hotel for three weeks before we launched the Tupperware business, finally found an apartment to live in. Uh, and this uh, shopping center, Gustini Dvor, is um, right on Nevsky Prospect, which is the main street in St. Petersburg. It was about a half a block from where we lived. We had a, a great location for our flat. But again, a story of lack of trust. When, when you went into this shopping center, now you can see it's fairly old. It was built by Catherine the Great, so it's been there for a long time. And the inside is structured differently than our typical uh, shopping centers here in the US. But they had these little kiosks that uh, were like you had to step to go up a step and then go in like you're going into a store, but there were no real doors on it. They had um, a chain across the door and a guard who stood at, the, at that chain he would only allow you to come into the store if you uh, if, if someone else had come out because they they didn't like the idea of having multiple people and when i say multiple i'm talking two or three in the store at the same time because again they didn't trust anybody and they didn't want to have to keep an eye on what they might be doing so you could only go in when someone else left and uh, I have to say, that's what was going on at Whole Foods here last week. We had to stand in line and wait for people to come out. So it brings back some really interesting memories when I have to live like that. But anyway, uh, I remember going in one day to buy something. And uh, I was actually going to buy some personal uh, female hygiene products that were pretty rare in Russia in those days. So I'm standing, I had to stand in line in order to get in. And I could see that in the glass case inside the store, there was only one box left. I was terrified that I'm not going to get in there in time. Somebody else might buy it and I'm going to be <laughs> up a creek. So anyway, it was, it was just interesting to, to live in that sort of an environment every day. That's how the Russians lived. So Gostini divorce, I'm told today that this is 20 years ago. So it has uh, changed to some degree, but the lack of trust is still there. Now I have to tell you the story about the brick wall. This is my favorite story. Okay, so we found a building in which to locate our Tupperware business, right? So we had to have an office and um, a sort of a warehouse where we could pack orders to be uh, put together for the Tupperware ladies to come and pick up so they could deliver the product to their customers. So we found a building that we thought was appropriate. And, um, and as with every Russian building, when you go in, there is a lady who looks just like this, who sits in a little uh, cubby hole sort of with a turnstile. And you don't go in unless she says it's okay. So <laughs> they, they have a really interesting control system, but she just has to approve that it's okay. And if you can't convince her it's okay for you to go in, you just don't get in. Anyway, um, when you get past the turnstile, there was this huge empty sort of a showroom, big empty room that um, could have been for putting cars or something it was that big. And then off of that was a hallway and down the hallway were rooms on either side of the hall. And we ended up renting all of those rooms on either side of the hall, but we didn't need that front foyer. So um, they were gonna then do some build out to change the structure a bit so that it would work for our purposes. So we ended up getting the lease signed and, and agreement made that this would be our place. We gave them instructions on how to change the, the structure so that we could do our business there. And then we went away. We had to meet with attorneys and accountants and all kinds of people to get the business legally set up in Russia and uh, find a place to live and all of those things. So after about a week or 10 days, we came back 
to check on the build out because they were supposed to have it finished in two weeks, I think. So when we got there, we walked through the turnstile and we walked into a brick wall that had been, it was halfway built, so it was about up waist high. And we couldn't get to our part of the building. So we had the lady by the turnstile call the, the guy in charge and say, could you please come and speak to us? So when he came down, I said, I'm not sure what you were thinking here, but we can't access our space now because of this brick wall. And he kind of scratched his head and he said, hmm, didn't think of that. Well, I don't know what we're gonna do. Solving problems was not possible in the Russian mind in those days. And finally, they ended up cutting a new wall, a new outdoor, uh, a new door in uh, the outside of the building so that we could access the building in a different place because they had leased that foyer to somebody else. And it just simply didn't occur to them that it was going to be a problem for us. So that's what it was like to live in Russia. The picture you see here are, are my protégés. These are the first 26 ladies that we started with in, in Russia. Uh, I call them the Pierre, which means the first ones. We had, um, we, we ran an ad in, in the St. Petersburg Times, a front page ad. We're looking for people, women who want to own their own business. We got 200 letters back from people who were interested. We interviewed 100 of them and picked the top, the best 26. Now. Of course, we couldn't look for somebody who had any sort of selling experience. There was nothing like that. So we just had to look for people who seemed to have the right personal characteristics, who could lead, had some leadership ability. And, uh, and so we picked them. We then met with them for uh, a full workday from nine to four every day for six weeks in a classroom environment to teach them how to go have friend, coffee with a friend. They didn't, they didn't know anything about how to build personal relationships with people because they didn't trust anybody. So no one ever invited anyone into their home. They were afraid they would tell on them, for, you know, snitch on them about something. So we had to teach them all of that sort of thing before we could teach them about plastic bowls and how to sell them to other people. It was really a wonderful experience. We ended up picking four and, uh, and this is uh, Sveta, Svetlana and her husband Alexander Andronov. She was one of our stars and uh, she and her husband have had a successful Tupperware business now for 20 years. They just retired actually and ended up buying um, a frozen yogurt store. <laughs> and So they've opened a yogurt franchise now, but they were just a delightful couple and she's still my Facebook friend. So um, just really lovely getting to know them. He was off in the Navy when she first started and uh, came back home and, and then joined her in the business. We lived in a, an apartment that was really a communal flat, which means there were several families who lived in our apartment before we did. It was big, certainly by Russian standards, but we had two bedrooms and a living room, kitchen, and a bathroom. <clears throat> the center controlled everything. We could not control our heat. They decide the heat goes on on this day and it stays at the temperature we set and we can't turn it off, up or down or anything. <laughs> so that was interesting not to have any control over our heat. <clears throat> we had no control over our water pressure. <laughs> <clears throat> so we actually collected water in a giant Tupperware bowl in order to be able to take a shower the next morning. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> And um, there were these ladies called Dvorniki. <clears throat> these were, Dvor, Dvor is uh, the word for courtyard. And <clears throat> the Dvorniki were Russian women who did all the physical work. Uh, the, the plowing of the streets, the repairing of buildings, the gardening, everything that was done, physical labor was done by women. Men in Russia <clears throat> have a very uh, low life expectancy. I think it's 59 because they, they typically drink themselves to death. So the men would go to work, sit around a boardroom table. There was no work to do, so they just drank vodka. And the women did all the physical labor. And I, I think it's still that way to some degree. One more really great story I have to tell you about Russia. There was a cathedral that you see the picture here. Um, we're Catholic, and this was an, actually a Roman Catholic cathedral, which is unusual in Russia because the Eastern Orthodox Church is the, the church of preference there, although there's not really much religion in Russia. But um, 
uh, we went to mass there every every Sunday. But the the story about the church is that back in in the during the revolution in 1917, all of the churches were taken away, taken over, and they were made into everything from um, vegetable warehouses to concert halls to anything. But there there just was no religion allowed, of course. And then in the 90s, uh, when Perestroika happened and, and the wall came down in, in Berlin, they gave the church back to Rome. But what had happened was that there were some, uh, some kids in the church. They had it full of scaffolding because it needed repair. And there were some teenagers in the church, I don't know, throwing dice or, or something up to no good. And they ended up setting the church on fire. Well, the fire marshal was on holiday when this happened. And because it's Russia, no one else could give permission to turn the water on. And so the church just burned. That again is because the, the, the soul is taken away by communism and, and the people had no, no opportunity or any ability to make decisions or to solve problems. And so I'm sorry if the guy in charge isn't here, everyone just kind of throws up their hands and says, I don't know what to do. I guess we just have to wait till he gets back. <laughs> and that is very typical what went on there. So, so now back to, I'm sorry. That's okay, Paula, we just got just a couple more minutes. Okay, okay. All right, I'm just gonna wrap up with why was I successful in, in, in direct selling? And then, you know, what, what's it all about today? I was successful because I had a strong why. I was motivated to make it work. Um, the, the effort has to be consistent. And I, uh, from the very beginning, I would do, uh, make phone calls, whatever it was, training my team consistently every week. And uh, it, it has to be that way or you, you just don't make it. Lots of people join direct selling because they fall in love with the product, but they don't really have the motivation to make it into a real business. Um, and my intention from the beginning was long-term. I wanted this to be the rest of my life. That's just not the case with everybody. It's also a very social business and lots of people stay, even though they don't, don't earn much money, because they love the products, they love their team, and they love the company. So it's very much a business of relationships. And, uh, and that thing I told you about the $1,000 at Jubilee, I, I said, you know, I, I've made lots of friends. I love being in this company. I get to walk across the stage. I don't need the money. I'll do it for the, the relationships. But uh, I did make some money. And our dream came true. We did buy a farm in Kentucky a few years back. Uh, we had a couple of mares, did some breeding and racing. And this is one of our horses actually about to cross the finish line at Churchill Downs. And so we have a, a trophy on our mantle about that. Now, why do so many people fail at direct selling? I hear all the time, just like my mother said, this is, this is a dumb thing to do. But the thing is that it's a simple business. It's simply not an easy business. So that means you have to work. You have to work consistently and you have to be committed to doing that. So a lot of people start off by asking their friends and family, would you buy some of this or would you host a party for me? And their friends and family will do it because they're their friends and family. But when it comes to the point where you have to ask somebody outside of that circle, it gets harder. So many people can't make it beyond them. They get scared, they freeze up, they don't wanna pick up the phone and make phone calls. And, and that's because their why isn't strong enough. Some people simply don't do enough of it to get any success at all. So they give up before they are about to find the first successful thing. So you have to have determination, you have to have patience and you have to have persistence. You gotta keep going even when you don't feel like it and you gotta show up, you just gotta keep showing up. And that's really what it's all about. And, and I would venture to say, there are just as many people who have tried real estate, insurance sales, all kinds of other selling careers and they don't last for the same reasons, because they don't have a strong enough why. So it's not that there's anything wrong with the business or the industry. And I think it will continue to be a really powerful industry. The gig economy is really strong. People are looking for something else to do, a part-time thing that can uh, supplement their normal income or something that gives them a chance to work from home. And of course, now everybody knows Zoom. 
everybody has worked from home to some degree now and that has a lot of appeal there's no glass ceiling so you can decide you could uh, decide from the beginning i only want to do this part time i only want a little bit enough money to pay for my product or whatever it is or you can decide this is going to be my long term uh, income and make it happen but you own your own business you have control over your life it is somewhat recession proof because every time there um, there's something like what's going on now that turns the world upside down people start to reflect on what they're doing with their lives and they say yeah you know what maybe i need to do something different and so it becomes a really good time to recruit and of course the recognition which is such a big big deal in the direct selling world is uh, really powerful. So I'm 75, I'm a grandma, I'm fiercely independent. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I'm very passionate about health and taking charge of your own health. So I live that, I walk the walk, I take care of myself and I teach other people to do it. I love, love, love helping other people discover this world of direct selling. And while that isn't my Ferrari, uh, we did have a chance to spend several weeks in Italy last fall and went to Maranello, which is the home of Ferrari, and got to have that picture made. But I feel like I have uh, just, as I said, lived a really blessed life, and I'm still living the dream. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. Very much, Paula. Um, <laughs> any questions for her? Does anyone have a question? Mike, what question might you have? Thanks, Kate. Paula, that last picture of a Ferrari, I was going to say, if Tupperware is passing out Ferraris, sign me up for a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, your specific stories of Russia might have seemed like it was going very deep into specifics, but it gave me a very sky level view of what it must be like in Russia. These people can't think for themselves and everything's yeah. centrally controlled and, and everybody's afraid of each other because they're all going to tell on each other because of exactly. the norms that have required people. So that, that was just crazy. It gave me real insight of what it must have been like to yeah. uh, start a business in, in that territory. And it sounds like you were successful. So congratulations. Thanks. And boy, you went through a lot of material. Very fulfilling. <laughs> What's that? It was very fulfilling because we were doing our, our sales meetings in a Communist Party meeting hall with the hammer and sickle on the wall. So it was, it was great. Thanks for shedding light over there. So do you have any other uh, thoughts on the industry, how it's evolved and where you think it might be in the future? Well, I, I try to stay uh, informed as much as I can. I, I, uh, uh, I know that there are direct selling companies that come and go. A lot of startups never really make it. Uh, and, and there are a lot of reasons for it, but typically it's because they don't understand what it needs to be. They don't understand that they have a volunteer sales force who can walk away at any moment. And, uh, and so um, I think that will continue to happen, but, but the good companies, the companies that figure that out and, and uh, are really committed for the long term, they're going to be around for a long, long time. And I, I see the industry continuing to grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate you taking the time today to give us that very unique uh, kind of <laughs> business arc that you had <laughs> and yeah. um and i love how you just it's all pulled back together where you when you know that that why and you um uh, just really have that focus on what is feeding you and and what you um are just what your skill set is it just shines through in the work that you do every day so it makes all the difference in the world and that's you're a perfect example of of that working so thank you very much for, for visiting with us today and I invite our membership, um, anybody that is watching this, perhaps on Facebook, please uh, post a question for Paula. I'm sure we can get some answers from her if you would have any follow-up questions that you would like us to share with her. And next week, next week our keynote speaker is to be determined, but you know us, keep an eye on the website, look in the newsletter, the spokes newsletter that you'll get this Friday, and that'll have the update of what you can expect next week. And so you all know, we're also working towards getting these to be live meetings so we can all be getting back together again online, that is, but um, having a larger group and we're just pulling all of that together to make it a um, to make it a good experience for everybody and not seem too crazy with all of our video windows. So we're getting it figured out. I want to thank everybody that spoke today, not just Paula, but also uh, Mike and for just giving us the update and for Reem also being here to give us our reflection. Thank you for viewing the meeting, hopefully with some family and friends this time. And um, 
That way they can understand what Rotary is, but also understand what Rotary does in fellowship and in service. I also have a new request for our members this week. You have been emailed a link to fill out a survey for the club. It comes from Riley Research, who, who is um, with former club member Mike Riley. And the email also might say it's from survey research, whatever the case, look in your spam if you haven't received it yet, but please do take the time to thoughtfully fill it out. It really does make a difference in the future of uh, Rotary and our club. We're asking you to share opinions on club preferences, activities, on priorities. Of course, our club looks different today than it does when we're not in the middle of a global pandemic, but the survey does aim to understand the interests and the values and the preferences of our club members in general. And then there are a few questions where we call out when it's focused on the uh, pandemic times, we can call it, I guess. Also a reminder for um, a couple of online fellowship opportunities, 10 a.m. on Tuesdays and Fridays, we have the online coffee room. Thursdays at four is the online social, where you get to hear some current industry insight from a different Rotarian each week. And Rotarian Angel Pilato, she's orchestrated a recipe gathering. It looks like it's going really well. I think I saw that uh, Rotarian AJ Barnett submitted a recipe for this week. I haven't read it yet. Can't wait to, that should be interesting. And as always, take care of you. Take care of yours. Reach out to a Rotarian this week. Let's continue our service work. There's plenty going on. Let's continue that work so that when we say that we are committed to service above self, it is more than a motto. It is a Rotarian value to uphold. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>